Rodney Cooney of Cooney Farms in Stirling Rawdon talks with Louise Livingston about making apple cider. He and his wife Lisa and their family run the apple store on Highway 14, north of Stirling. Dryzer cider, right? No. So you can't break the skin on an apple and have it touch wood. Okay. So you have to get them straight off the tree. Well, once you once you grind them, yeah. when you break the skin, yeah. that's why you can't have any wood on your press okay. unless you're pasteurizing. So why one because wood can't be sterilized. That's right. So we built this. We had this built in uh, '83. We did a few modifications to it since then, but other than that, it's pretty well original since '83. Bruce Colder built it first, actually. Oh, that on the highway. Yeah, 14, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. We told him how we wanted it done, but he made the mechanics work on it. Okay. Right. So. And we may, we can we can press thirty gallon or thirty bushel an hour, pretty easy, pretty easy. And how many gallons does that make? It'll probably 30, 30 bushel, depending on your apples, that's the next thing, right? Depending on the time of year and everything else. You can usually, 30 bushel, you can usually get 80 gallons, 80 to 90 gallons of cider, roughly. It varies. We use about 90% Macintosh. We find that gives you your best use. You can get some Mutsu thrown in there and some spice. It gives it a little extra flavor. But all your delicious varieties, like delicious and some of your uh, empires and all that, they don't have much cider in them. Because they don't have the juice? Or yeah, the yeah, it's a variety of apple. Yeah. I always say they absorb cider, but I don't think they do, but they just don't have much in them. Okay. Tell me a, a, a bit about... You know, the history of apples here, because you used to grow your own. And yeah, things yeah, things we like. had... Uh, but how far back does that go? We The, the apple orchard was... Well, I, I would say the apple orchard was probably planted around 1920. Mm -hmm. And Dad and Norm bought the orchard in 76 from Elton Hadley. And then mm -hmm. I, I bought my uncle out, uh, Norm, in 89. And this building here was built... In 83. Uh, just to the side, we were down at the um, county cider, in, you know, down in Picton, the guy who makes the, the hard cider there. Mm -hmm. And he was saying down there in 1937 there was a monumental frost that finished off most of the apple trees. Yeah. Did, did that happen here? Or was... uh, I don't know if it happened then because obviously I wasn't well, we here. Went around, but but uh, we had a really, really bad frost in uh, 1980 because it, it killed a lot of our spy trees. Because spy trees never really go dormant compared to other trees. Okay. And then when I was in Nashville with my sister and her husband in around 1990, mm -hmm. we had a real devastating frost. It was minus 40 for about four days, and it finished the rest of our spy trees. And they've changed the rootstock on the trees. Yeah. All apple trees are grafted to wild rootstock. Yep. So they changed the rootstocks on the trees, and they weren't quite as susceptible to cold. So but so I, you, you used to be on the wild ones. Yep, okay. And we still, if we were still planting today, yep. you'd be on wild rootstock, yep. but it'd be a different number. But, but obviously the winters aren't as cold as they used to be either, right? Okay. doesn't seem to be anyway. Okay. But, yeah, we, we, we had two devastating frosts that, uh, that were really hard on our... On our spy tree. It splits them, eh? Because yeah. because a spy tree doesn't seem to go dormant. It seems to have sap in them, so it splits them. More so than any other tree. Have you got any trees, not even just the odd ones? Yeah, because you've changed the whole farming system. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Where, where do your apples come from now? We have four suppliers in, uh, in Brighton area. And that... And that, see, we had standard trees. We had no, we had no semi dwarfs. We had all standards. Oh, yeah. okay. And you can't grow the fruit on the standard trees. You came on a semi dwarf, right? Okay. You were all standard, not, not dwarf. And then, yeah, then you had the problem of picking them too. Yeah, you're way up in the air and ladders and big ladders, eh? Um, we used to have, we probably had about ten varieties of apples when we were growing apples. But, what, what would they have been? Oh, we had. Uh, we had Macintosh, obviously. Macintosh was 90% of our apples. And we had Delicious, 
And we had uh, Spartan and Cortland and Tomlin Sweet. We had some Pippin, which nobody even hears of. It was like cops with those. I don't know where they're from. We had we had two of these Pippin trees. They were little wee freaking things. They looked like a crab apple. And we had Baxters, which were a great big apple, yes. just huge. And we had two snow trees, just a little bit of everything yeah. kicking around out there. But but Macintosh were a number one apple. Yeah. Oh, we had uh, Wealthies, too. Okay. I used to hate them because you always had to pick them right during hay. Oh, so really early. Yeah, really early. And then we had uh, the next earliest apple was Quinny Apple. Oh, you had some of them to eat. And they were a great apple, and we'd always eat them during straw. Yes. But the trouble is, they bruise. You only they'd only save for about two days. And we had Melbus, and they'd okay. come they'd come right after Quinnies. But they were the same way; they only save for about four days. Eh? They've kind of done away with them varieties because yeah. it's like a bad soybean. You just do away with that variety, right? What happened with us with our apples is. We went from 50 acres to 6 acres, yes. strictly for cider, because all our cider is yes. hand-picked. Yeah. And a standard tree, a green apple yes. and a red apple taste the same, yeah. but you can't get a red apple off a standard tree compared to a semi-dwarf. It's like, why can't you get a red apple? Because there's just way too much foliage. The tree's so wide. Oh, you can't control the foliage? Okay. You know, so so the sun doesn't penetrate. No, you, you, just get, you just get much better fruit off a of semi-dwarf. That's why everybody went to semi-dwarfs. Mm-hmm. And now they're growing apple trees like grapes, right? They're running, they're running cables, and they're running even closer together. Are there any? Do you see any problems with that? Or do you think that's you know? It's the way of the future. They grow less apples per tree, but they have more more sellable fruit per tree. You know what I mean? Like we used to have trees that give you 25, 30 bushel, but. Now you got a tree that gives you 12 bushel, but you sell all 12 bushel, right? Yeah, because you can pick, pick. I forget how many apples he said there is in the world, 400. People, people come in here all the time asking for apples we never ever heard of. You know, we, see, we had trees all around this building, yeah. but that was just, just a complete nightmare trying to come down and spray them and all that stuff. Okay, you, can't, okay. you can't grow. There's no such thing as organic fruit, eh? No. People will tell you there is, but there's not. If you don't, if you don't spray them, you don't have nothing. And, you know, we didn't spray. They recommend you spray apples every 10 days. We never, ever did. But that's what they recommend. Same with sweet corn, right? Yeah. Why spraying sweet corn? Corn borer. You have to spray it every 10 days. But you don't do that for your cow corn, do you? No. 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 Well, do, is that because it doesn't matter if it's got corn borer in it? Or? Oh, yeah, it matters, but you're just taking the whole field. You're not... When you pick an individual cob and I sell it to you and you roll it back and you see a corn borer in there, you're probably not going to eat it or maybe the other 11, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you don't mind about the pesticides that go yeah. on to it. Yeah. Um, you know, from you personally, you've been making cider since you were a kid, have you? Or? No. We started making cider in 84. We tried, they, tried to make a, they tried to make some apple cider in the late 70s, but they never ever had any, anything that was... Up to snuff. We tried an old wooden wine press and all this other stuff, but it never ever panned out. And they tried to they tried to ban cider in Ontario. Unpasteurized. Yes, yes. I got pamphlets and brochures, and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency they come and inspect us all the time. The one year we had the Canadian, they had a they had cider. They had a lady hired by Omafra that strictly she went around all the people making cider in Ontario. She was here about three times. Then we had the Canadian Food Inspection Agency here once or twice. Then we had the health unit from Belleville here once or twice, one year. And we had oceans and fisheries here one year inspecting us because they had not. And see, they sent my cider away there for about two or three years. They sent our cider to Ottawa, Quebec, New Brunswick, Winnipeg, somewhere up around London. And they tested it for everything, all of this different stuff. And it come back perfect. We've been in, we get inspected still by the health unit and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, but they it hasn't been near as bad as it was there through the through probably the late nineties, early two thousands. It was just crazy. They we had somebody here every week. Tell me in a bit more detail about 
crushing them, uh, you know, crushing and pressing, and you know what what sort of size do you have to? Uh, we don't like it too fine because uh, then it, it the way we press it, it doesn't stay in. So. Well, what do, you, what do you mean the way you press it, it doesn't stay in? Well, if we if we get it too fine when we press it, the, it'll explode out of the basket, right? So when we we press it, it everything's like, it's, we most of the stuff's all at least a quarter of an inch. Yeah. But see, when our when our apple palms come out of that, they're they're still fairly damp because we, we're pushing apple to apple. You can't, you can't make cider pushing apple to apple. Like when you grind, that basket holds five bushel four bushel so when you press four bushel of apples and you're using apple to push the apple you can't get all the juice out like i don't know if we would get 50 percent of the juice out of them i'm not sure but see the big cider plants what they used to do is they added rice hulls because rice hulls won't absorb moisture so they put all these rice hulls in so you'd have apple to rice hull and they'd get you know 85 90 percent of the juice out but now They've all went away from that because you used to have to buy all these rice hauls in from down the states. And these tractor trailers, they, they, they don't load them like shavings. They just, they're just they just bagged like shavings. You'd buy at Bob's. So now what they've went to is they went to it looks almost like a paper mill set of rollers. So the apples get ground. They come in. They come on a belt. And they go up through and they go through a set of rollers. So it's roller on roller with apple. So then they get about 95, 98% of the juice out of the apples because it's the apple is just on roller on roller, and it goes through, and it squishes all the juice out of it. And then the apples just, and they're fairly dry, eh? And somebody I was talking to the other day said they're actually bagging them for deer feed, some of it. Like, not all of it, obviously, but... But with this one, you've, you're apple on it's apple? It's just apple on apple, yeah. What do you do with all the... We have a guy that, uh, from Gunner, buys it all. and oh, feed, yeah. He has a deer yard behind his house, and he feeds deer. Or elk or whatever come in. Oh, it goes up to feed the elk. <laughs> we over the years we've had different guys want it for pigs and all that. And we we sell whole apples for horses, but we've never really sold much apple palms to guys for horses. More whole apples. But uh, over the years we've had different people want it. But this one gentleman we've had for six or seven years, when we phone him, he comes and gets it. Other people, because we can't have it sitting out there when it's warm. The bees and stuff are in the store, right? So. Most years, we always have, you know, you always have, try to have more apples than you're going to sell. So, usually the first week of January, we'll press all the rest of the apples we have. And we'll, you'll make anywhere from 500 to 1,000 gallons of cider, and you freeze it. Because once you freeze cider, it's good forever. And then we'll have a whole whack of apple. You might have 100 bushel of apples ground sitting on the ground out there. Yeah. And he comes and gets them, takes it home, shovels it all off in the field, and then he goes out with an axe. He feeds them till he runs out. He feeds them year round if he has it. When do you open again? She opens the long weekend in May. She's open every day till December thirty first. We tried it this year every day. We used to just be open on weekends till September, but ten to five. It worked out pretty good this year. Plus, I think a lot of the people in the summer through the week that stopped are stopping more now. We used to just open on the weekends. Well, there was some traffic you weren't getting through the week, but we didn't have time with the kids being young and everything. And we're busy enough now for a full-time employee besides family. So Lisa hired a full-time lady to help her, which is Mark Kittle. You know Mark. Yeah. And you've got your, your, all your meat. Yeah. Uh, and the cheeses. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've got some pies and stuff like that. She's got pies, and she's got uh, she's got some candies and stuff, and she sells baked goods and and maple syrup. And 